Welcome to the Carnivore Cast, the podcast focused on the carnivore diet and lifestyle, with practical advice from successful carnivores, citizen scientists, and top researchers. I'm your host, Scott Meslinski, and I'm here to speak with experts and experienced carnivores to get answers to your biggest and meatiest questions while helping you live your best life as a carnivore. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Dr. Hannah Roberts is a practicing naturopathic physician from Hawaii. Hannah personally used low carb for decades to overcome compulsive eating before progressing to paleo, keto, and eventually strict carnivore and hyper carnivore, sounds familiar, uh, which has improved her physical and mental health substantially. Welcome to the show, Hannah. Hey, aloha, Scott. I love your podcast so much. I've been doing a big, big dive into it. And I just, I think you interview interesting people and are such a great part of the community. So thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you. Um, really a pleasure to have you on. And I think you have a lot of interesting perspectives based on your experience personally and professionally, um, which will be helpful for listeners. So why don't we start with the personal side first? Um, you know, tell us how you came across carnivore and, and even, you know, how your eating journey began. Right. So I grew up pretty strict macrobiotic. So I was a bit meat starved there. I would, I would scrounge the meat when I could at friends' houses. Um, so I think I was a little depleted there to begin with. Um, I was pretty fine with food in high school, although I think I could just get away with eating five bagels at that point and, you know, <laughs> kind of walk off and enough sun and my metabolism was okay. But uh, definitely went in and out of some depression very young. Um, it wasn't until college that I really sort of hit the wall, whether it's a cliche, but just the loneliness of college and the access to mass amounts of food. I went into a pretty intense binge eating disorder where, uh, yeah, coffee shop to coffee shop and, you know, bags of Oreos to it, it's pretty dark. And I think it's a bulimia and anorexia get a lot of a lot of uh, airspace, but binge eating disorder is actually the most common eating disorder. And it's pretty dark too. So yeah, compulsive overeating, processed food. I realized that was an issue in college. And I've always been on that sort of research, like look into science, look into ancestral health to kind of figure it out because it just has never made sense to me. Like, why are we all so sick? This is not normal, right? And I figured out, okay, I'm gluten sensitive, can't eat processed food, can't eat sugar. And so that was super helpful uh, early 2000s to just kind of go down the rabbit hole of a little bit of Weston Price, Atkins, kind of low carb. But I, I didn't, I didn't, I wish I had gone further at that point, but I, I stopped the extreme binging. And then since then, it's been dipping into Weston Price and paleo and gaps and studying all of it. And the last 13 months, a little over a year, diving into the carnivore and just been so amazed by the power of, and I, I was pretty low carb too, which is it's a common thing to say, but it's amazing to go from pretty meat heavy keto to carnivore and then just be like, wait, what? Like it's still, it's still that much better. How How is that possible? So it's been interesting. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. Um, and great, great to hear that it's working for you. Um, but I think a lot of people have, you know, similar challenges. You just don't really examine your, your health and your food until you need to. Um, and curious how you use carnivore in your medical practice. You know, what, what have you learned over time working with people with regards to diet? Yeah. So I was, I was doing a lot of the, autoimmune, paleo, and kind of really trying to look at each person and trying to, okay, your autoimmune patient, let's really, yeah, let's get those lectins out and the grains and let's see how do you digest certain vegetables. And, the, you know, there's, there's such a, there's so many rabbit holes you can go into. And it was helpful to, to a degree, but it's also so much simpler to, to not give people a long list of things of, 
histamines and FODMAPs and this and, and low carb and, and to just focus on the meat and then see what, what sort of plant foods people can deal with. Um, but it, you know, I, I think, I think that Natasha Campbell McBride says it well, where she's like, animal food is a nutrition and plants are cleansers. And, and she even admits too, like some of her toughest ulcerative colitis cases, a lot of the kids, it's not until she eliminates all the plants that she gets somewhere with a certain portion of people. So I really, really in study of paleo medicina, I think they're doing amazing work and they're kind of on one extreme of just so pure in this way that we can really study their gut permeability, their protocols. And, and then on the other extreme is people doing like dirty carnivore and, you know, uh, yeah. So I, I would say I'm not like in a, I'm still in study. I don't think there's, I'm not like strongly, uh, I, I think we're still, we're still figuring it out and people are different too. So I could go into some of the, some people that have failed on carnivore and why I think they need a little bit of fruit or a little bit of plants and I've seen it, but, um, for the most part, it's pretty great and it works. It's like a species specific diet, you know, and that's more and more where I'm like, how can one thing treat so many different things so well and it's just like well if it's species appropriate and has everything you need and nothing you don't there you go we don't have to worry about anything else so yeah yeah um super interesting and yeah i would love to get into that question of um you know who who needs some plants or for whom 100% carnivore doesn't work. Uh, but first, um, you know, I feel like before we dive into that, it'd be helpful to talk about maybe some of the conditions or types of patients um, you're working with, just so people can understand your your patient population and context around that. Right. So I'm a naturopathic physician. So we get some of the the, the sick, weird ones, you know, I, I'm also in the, on the big island. So it's the land of raw fruitarians and and those types as well, because we actually can just eat fruit off trees here. But I, yeah, I have a small private practice where I'm doing a lot of metabolic disease, you know, your basic diabetes and hypertension and that, a lot of mental illness work and some adjunctive oncology, chronic fatigue, basically people who are not getting to where they want to want to be with um, regular medicine and they need more. Um, and kind of, you know, I mean, you could call it functional medicine. We're kind of overlapping in some ways as naturopaths, although a lot more training in, in some of the things that I'm a little more distant from, like some of the roots of naturopathy are great, like the sun and hydrotherapy, a little homeopathy, but a lot of the, the heavy reliance on herbs and vegetarian diets and some of the aspects of naturopathy I'm kind of moved away from and, and also just the heavy supplement use of kind of, uh, it just seems like there's judicious use of it, but we're just, I think we're over relying on it. And it, I don't think it gets people that far when it's overused. So that's kind of, that, that's been amazing. Carnivore for my practice has been amazing because it's really simplified and made me, I think we always have to sort of look at ourselves and look at what we're doing in a questioning way. Because you, once you think you know something, you basically, you're, you're gone. That's when you, when you think, you know, then it's over, I think. So. Yeah. Um, very interesting. And, and now maybe, you know, what, what separates someone, so a lot of people, I've seen different reasons why people can't do just a hundred percent carnivore. Um, but would love to hear some of yours. Um, and I also think I, I rant about this all the time, but I think the word carnivore, um, is used as a form of shorthand in the community we're in saying, if you're, if you eat only a hundred percent animal products, then you are carnivore. If you eat anything else, then you are not. But really, if we look at the biological meaning of the word carnivore, it's, it's if you eat meat at all. Um, so, you know, we're all carnivores as long as you're not a vegan. Um, but I, I understand the shorthand, but, but can you talk a little bit about folks for whom, carnivore doesn't work um, in some of the reasons you've seen? Well, I can, I can link to one, one thing recently. Um, a patient has low platelets for a variety of reasons, like medical conditions. And so pure carnivore, no plant foods, he's bruising a lot. And for what, if he just adds in one orange a day, 
his bruising goes way down. And so whether it's the vitamin C or a little of bioflavonoids, he's not someone where, you know, there's, there's people with, with extreme leaky gut or autoimmune or extreme carb abstinence requirements, right? Where one piece of fruit sends them into a binge. And I've been there before, but uh, he's not one of them, right? So is one piece of fruit hurting him or helping him? Like I, I'd argue, I'd argue it helps. And, you know, for me, like there, there's something about the taste of the astringent and the sour, like a squeeze of lemon in my water or just on my meat, like the little bits of, of plant foods use, you know, a little bit of orange peel for the more, most, for, mostly for the hormesis, not, not sort of like taking these flavonoids and these plant compounds as these like the new gods, which I think a lot of people do like, Oh my God, the, the, whatever this little biochemical compound, amazing. But, um, they're, they do have power in the judicious right amount and not like mainlining just raw kale and throwing hunks of turmeric in your smoothie and oxalate bombing yourself or, or, you know, so it's, uh, it's interesting. And then I, I go back to paleo medicine a lot because I, I'm in study of, of them. And they say, they say when you're healthy, 30% of the diet can be well-chosen formulated fruits and veg, right? So I think I think they're onto something there. And then, uh, yeah, it, it's there's so many different uh, varieties, but I think the people that need pure abstinence of carbs because they have, for whatever reason, dysbiosis and the fiber or the, the carbs send them into like a carb creep where they start create like an alcoholic. You know, you wouldn't say to the alcoholic, "Hey, just have some light beer." You know, you'd be like. Ah, uh, no, you need to be abstinent. So some people are like that with carbs and I'm, I'm, I border on it. So, but yeah, these are just some of the, the little into the weeds of, of this sort of issue. Yeah. I, I've seen similar things. You know, one thing is, is just around compliance. You know, some folks need a little piece of dark chocolate, you know, coffee, other things to, to keep them compliant. And I think, you know, if, if, if 90, 95% carnivore and, you know, maybe some, you know, keto bars or something keeps you on track and keeps you eating mostly meat, then that's fantastic. Um, another thing I see is digestion. Some people can't handle just a ton of meat. There's a lot of ways to troubleshoot that, but sometimes it's easier to just include a little bit of plant matter um, to make up for that, um, especially when you're adapting and your gut can't handle a large amount of protein and fat um, as you're building up the capacity to produce more stomach acid. Yeah, and for someone who who was pretty keto, I was pretty keto during pregnancy, but then I was I was a little brainwashed into thinking, okay, you can't do low carb when you're pregnant. So I probably could have been more stringent there. And then I was seven months when I breastfeeding. At my my daughter was seven months old when I went really strict carnivore, and I I seemed to do fine in. In some ways, I think my breast, my, probably my breast milk had more zinc than ever. And it was, it was lots of fat, you know, lots of cream, cream at the top of that breast milk. But at the same time, I've seen in some, I like to follow Facebook groups and there's science in, in people's experience. And I have seen a case of someone breastfeeding who, who had to go to the ER with her ketones were, I don't know, at 11 or 13 or, and I'm not really sure if that's because she was carnivore and like too strict and needed a little bit of fruit or a little bit of dairy or, or what she needed. But uh, but then there's other people who talk about just being super strict carnivore all through breastfeeding. And so I don't think we've really uh, figured that out completely. But breastfeeding is I'm kind of like it's not my time to be super pure and like do my experiments of the lion diet of just beef, salt, water. I'm, I, I kind of need to. You know, until I wean, I got to I got to just, you know, maybe a couple pieces of fruit a week if I'm craving it. I'm not I'm not trying to be judgmental of that. I'm trying to listen to my body. So it's interesting. Yeah. And and um, I I'm hugely supportive of that. I obviously know almost nothing about pregnancy and breastfeeding, but I know Jessica Haggard, um, Tristan Haggard's wife of Primal Edge Health in her pregnancies, she's followed a similar approach where she introduced a certain amount of, of carbohydrates, you know, 
uh, fruit, um, other sources, honey. Um, and I think that makes a lot of sense. I've heard women can go up to a, a much higher amount of carbohydrates and still be in ketosis during pregnancy. Yeah, you get all insulin resistant just to shunt everything to the baby. And it's it's weird, the food cravings. Uh, but I, I was lucky not to, I think, trying to stay low carb, I I didn't get any gestational diabetes. I didn't gain much weight. I went back to my, my normal weight easily. It, it, so it's, I think, you know, everyone can be low carb pregnancy very safely and probably should aspire to that because then you're eating nutrient dense without a lot of, you know, ice cream at night and all the little excuses pregnant women give themselves. I'm like, (laughs) yeah. And, um, how about uh, just on that gestational diabetes? Um, did you did you find a way to avoid the oral glucose tolerance tests that they give to women during pregnancy, or did you did you do that? Right, I yeah, I, because nothing was out of line. I forget which exact marker was the cutoff, but uh, my my midwife was was cool with that. She's like, "No, nah, we don't need to do that. You're fine." That's good. Um, yeah, so I've heard that stuff's really nasty. <laughs> Well, kind of weird to just, oh, let's give you, I mean, it's, it's much more than one soda. I forget how many grams, but it's basically like just straight sugar. Wow. And, and I've heard even if you test positive for gestational diabetes, they pretty much don't do anything. Um, they just give you, they pres- or, or they prescribe like a, a diabetic diet, which is nonsense. I know even, even the, it's amazing how under treat, I'm, Treating, you know, I've treated a lot of type two diabetes, but treating more and more type one, and even it's just amazing how they'll. I, I I don't understand in medicine in general and science. I don't understand how people can be so smart, like way smarter than me in all these ways. Yet basic things like maybe we should limit carbs and and not inject so much insulin and type one. You know, it's like it's very it's very weird when you kind of take a step back and look at how we operate. It's, uh, it's, it's most laughable really. Yeah. Um, and, and how about, uh, feeding kids and and raising kids? How how do you view nutrition there? Yeah, I, it's a struggle. I, um, I try to just focus on starving them. I know that sounds bad, but if, if you give into my, my mom just took them to get, he got chocolate cake ice cream yesterday and he was calling me on the phone to, to negotiate why he should have it. And he's like, well, chocolate is a plant and it's non GMO mom. And I was just like, whatever, just have it. But at home, uh, I have more control and I just try to get him to eat. If he's hungry enough, he'll eat the steak. And he's, I guess he's made to be a bodybuilder. My son's six, but he won't have any bit of fat or gristle on it. So I've cut like, super lean, rare steak. But if I get a brisket from Costco and smoke it, then he'll, I can trick him to get the fat and the collagen in there. Cause it's basically all marbled in and, you know, just, uh, it's a struggle. I, um, I'm doing okay. I try to keep it paleo in the house mostly, but my daughter's much easier. We have a, she's two and we, um, we have our steak morning where, you know, there's something about really overcooked meat that is a danger to swallow and chew. And mm. I, I remember the kid almost choking on a piece of steak. But if you if you cook it really rare, she and and you kind of let them sort of gum it and she she rips pieces off and she swallows, she gets a big piece of steak and she mows it down. So and and here here's one thing I think is very under discussed with kids is I always thought that facial development was really due to genetics and to fat soluble vitamins. And you listen to Weston Price, like having a nice, nice wide maxilla and mandible and having, you know, straight teeth is all fat soluble. But more and more, if you follow the work of Dr. Mew, it is that as well. But the other thing is chewing. And so part of our modern madness with kids is all this mushy, weird carb little so everything's mush and so they're not chewing and it's the chewing that actually brings in the teeth straight and you know, nose break. It's a, it's a whole thing you can look into, but, um, so meat, meat's nice. You chew and you get all the, all the vitamins and zinc you need and minerals and 
all of it. So, yeah. That's that sounds like a very balanced approach, um, and I I think makes a lot of sense. It doesn't sound like you're starving your kids at all, though. I think it sounds more like you're you're feeding you're emphasizing nutrient dense, um, you know, proper food, um, and letting them eat as much as they want. Right, that, that's not the right word, but I I got that from is I think that the documentary is the magic pill, and it was fascinating. They were just implementing a paleo diet, but they went to the Aboriginal people and they also took this autistic girl and she was, she was straight eating just Doritos and chicken nuggets. And in order to get her onto eating a paleo diet, they had to basically starve her for five days and she finally ate. But that is a way, like if you have, like, I'd say my, my son's a bit addicted to sugar and and that sort of, I mean, we all, we all are right. But if you, if you starve them of it a little and then you just keep offering the protein and fat first and then they can fill up on the fruit or the, the carbs or the whatever, then that seems to be a good approach. And, and, but we're sort of trained like, Oh, they got to have a snack or, Oh, they're going to melt down. I got to feed them. They're going to like lose it. And so I think we're a little over anxious and we, and we're not strict enough. So I'm, I'm trying to be stricter. I, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I can't imagine the challenges. Um, I, I have a lot of respect for you, um, you know, raising your kids that way. Um, and can you talk about, you know, getting back to your professional experience, why most, um, NDs and functional MDs are so obsessed with plants and supplements, but critical of red meat, um, overall? Yeah, I, that is the elephant in the room because, uh, I mean, there are some, there are some that will not, not shit on red meat, but there's most, most of them are like plants are, they've become magical creatures and, and we're ingrained to, they're beautiful, uh, we're, we're brainwashed into, into using botanical medicine and to use, for example, okay, someone's estrogen dominant and they're, they're not metabolizing their estrogen. Well, we got to give them dim and cruciferous vegetable stat, you know, it's like, or you could just help them lose weight and eat meat and not be overproducing insulin in their fat. You know, we could, we could work more um, upstream rather than downstream. So uh, that, and then just some of the lies around red meat being bad for the environment and, there, I remember learning about um, the BS we learn in school. I learned a lot of great stuff too, but the BS about meat meat being metabolized into these toxins. I forget even the names of some of the oh, putrescine and some of these these compounds that apparently happen in your gut. And the more you learn about it, or like the mucoid plaque that this thick plaque that's in there, and it's the more you learn about it. No, I like look at someone with an ileostomy, right? Every time they'll they'll pass just liquid if they eat meat and if they eat a lot of food and plants, it's okay, there's a lot of solids there. And it it's actually the opposite. What rots in your gut? Plants rot in your gut. Like Yeah. Yeah. So I'm always like I'm trying to spread the gospel of meat, but like to to challenge people, like, okay, here, here's an example. I had a patient, he's feeling great eating a lot more red meat from being vegan and he goes to this fancy clinic and I am not really sure. So I, I don't know exactly what, why they prescribed. Oh, well, I think it was partly his high LDL that, although I think he's a lean mass hyper responder, they're like, okay, no, you can't eat red meat more than once a week, you know, definitely chicken fish. And it's like, well, maybe, but you felt a lot better on red meat and, you know, let, let's get your coronary calcium score. Let's really see if you have cardiovascular risk before we we get all up in arms with your LDL, which, yeah, so it, it gets complex. I think people, um, for lots of reasons, are not understanding red meat. And uh, it, it boggles my mind how, oh, my God, celery juice is the new newest amazing thing and turmeric and this. And it's just, it's. It's mad. It's literal madness. I, I think it's. I, I don't know. The cults of false. The false gods are being worshipped. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's scary. I I totally agree. And Hannah, um, you know, let's let's talk a little bit about 
locally, um, you know, you mentioned salads killing people on, on your island in Hawaii. Um, what's going on there? Yeah, so it is serious here. There's other reasons why we're we're trying to only get salad greens from the mainland and we're scared. So there's this parasite, it's rat lungworm, and it, it's originated in China, but about 12, 15 years ago, this certain slug, we've, we've had it here. There's been some cases back in the 50s in Hawaii of someone eating a slug. Um, it's a gross life cycle, but the synopsis is it lives in rats and it, it comes out of their feces and the slugs pick it up and they are the ones that kind of aggregate it. And it's the larva that can then, if you mistakenly eat a slug, so there's some kids who on a dare, they're like, oh, go eat the slug. And then they ate the slug, got really sick. But most people are not going to eat a huge slug or snail. It's when they're really tiny and they're on lettuce or kale that it's been the biggest problem here. So it can be really these tiny little specks. And if it's poorly washed lettuce or raw kale smoothie, you know, all those little folds in the curly kale. I had a patient who got it from a raw kale smoothie. Then that the little slug, it, it might, the larva and the slug migrate to your central nervous system and cause uh, eosinophilic meningitis. And it, it's kind of like Lyme disease, like really just pain and even worse. If you get a really bad case of it, there, you can go into coma and death. And there's not much treatment of it when it's really bad. There's just steroids because if you kill it with, say, albendazole, you'll actually cause too much die off and cytokines and you could kill the person. So, so with that said, I mean, it sounds very, very scary. And it is like, I know of a, of someone whose husband committed suicide because of the depression after. And on the other side wow. of the island, where there's a lot more of it and everyone's on catchment. And so the slugs are in their water and the larva, little toddlers going blind, like they say, they, they drink the hose and it comes in or they're all eating, you know, raw salad or it's, it's around more Then if you get enough of it, you can, you can go into a coma. And it seems to be that my, and then it's come up to where I live in the last year, which is scary. And I have some cases of it and there's a lot you can do, but it, it causes this crazy chronic pain syndromes too. So yeah, that's why we're not, we're very, we're very scared of eating salad here. And pe- if you cook the greens, you're fine. So that's what most people do when they're going to eat their greens, they cook it, but it, it's on the spread. So it's going to, it's, it's been found in the Southern United States and it's going to be a more well-known thing. So yeah, I mean, is it worth it? Like my patient who's, whose life's been pretty destroyed here, he was just eating salad out of his yard and he found a slug in his salad. And 10 days later, he was just like, mainlined and this is this is not this is not like a sick person you know a lot of things can be worse when you're just weak already this was like charging young guy the kind of people you never see in your practice because they're just healthy and they never come to you so yeah other reasons not to eat salad here (laughs) god yeah that's actually pretty scary um and I, I guess let, let's shift back to your your personal approach to, to your nutrition and carnivore. Um, you know, talk about what a day of eating looks like for you and, and, and please be specific with the details, you know, maybe things you've learned over time, either either working with your patients or, or through your own personal experiments around, you know, what foods you eat, when, how much, um, and, and anything you include around it, like supplements and organs as well. Yeah, so I I am blessed with a lot of raw and pastured grass fed meat here. So I get a part of a cow and lamb. I have local lamb, and I I've been I've been trying to push push my edge and self experiment with eating more raw meat because you kind of go down that rabbit hole and people swear by you know, the raw meat. It, it makes sense in that you're not damaging a lot of the compounds or leaching out a lot of the minerals. I can't say that I have a huge taste for it. Like if I, if I really marinate the steak or, uh, I can get it down and I, I do like raw liver. I think it's better that way. If you just kind of get a glass of water, I'm not a fan of liver. So I, I just freeze it, chunk it up. And if I, if I kind of 
I don't even have to chew it. If I cut it small and just swallow it down, then there it is. Um, but I, yeah, so I can't say that I've noticed with eating more raw carnivore that it's really been amazing. I will say though that eating really rare blue, you know, I try to eat things very rare and, and fat I find troublesome. I'm recently trying to, I think I'm going to play a little with supplementation in terms of betaine HCL or some digestive enzymes just because not that I have digestive issues per se, but I just find that I can't tolerate very high fat and I'd like to push my fat even higher. And I, and I just thinking that might help me a little bit there kind of adjust to that. Um, what types of fat have you tried? So I'm, I'm mainly eating, I'm trying to, to my new year's resolution is give up the dairy. Cause it, it just seems a little, seems to inflame me a little bit and I can get away with it, but I like to see without it, how I do. Right. I'm mostly doing steak a couple times a day and trying to add fat to like getting fat trimmings or I, I think I do better with the fat trimmings rather than say, I, I, I just don't really like, I'll put bacon grease or tallow grass fed tallow on it. But you know, the, the whole thing with li- the issues with liquid fat and how they just can make you more nauseous. And I think there's an issue with the lipopolysaccharides of bacteria. They kind of, it's been shown that too much fat can kind of make you absorb those more. So that's where I think that the value of raw carnivore with the fat, like if you can cut up the raw fat, then it's not all rendered into this big grease pile in the pan and it's more absorbable and it seems to digest better. I just don't really have a taste where it. it's kind of waxy. So I, 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 I'm, I'm giving you the, my struggles with, uh, you know, trying to do that two to one paleolithic ketogenic level. And, and I know I do better when, um, when my fat's up, but I, yeah, I, I'd ra- I'm more of like a top sirloin girl kind of like I like it leaner and putting some butter on it. I might go back to ghee or butter. We'll see without it how I do and, you know, that sort of thing. But a little chicken maybe or, you know, a little salmon, a little eggs. Uh, sometimes I'll I'll smoke a brisket, like I said, for my son because it seems to be popular in the house and – but it had kind of, and I try to eat the whole eighth of a cow, but then I'm, I'm left with these random cuts and I'm like, I don't really like too much beef stew. It was good, but I'd rather just eat a steak. So I think I'm just going to stick. I have nice grass fed steaks right in the supermarket, like from down the street. So I can just, it's expensive, but just buy ribeyes and that and go with that. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and can you talk a little bit about organs and, and how you, and um, how you incorporate those or any supplements you use electrolytes maybe? Yeah, I love, I, I think enough salt is the main electrolyte we need and, and whether we need to supplement that, that's another one where it seems like people are so on different, different sides. Like they're so like, Oh, salt ruins me. You know, like I retain water. It's like other people, it's like without salt, they, they die, you know? So it's, seems like to each their own with the salt, just like to each their own with cooking. But I do like, I do like some Redmond's and some electrolyte mixes. And I, I recently realized the issue of copper toxicity. And I think this is something that's not really well talked about in the carnivore world. Like we definitely talk a lot about plants having a lot of oxalates and lectins and these things, but we're not really talking about copper. And so it's a real rampant toxicity, especially in women. And that's one thing I'm evaluating with liver. Like liver is an amazing superfood, right? It's got all the Bs and it's so nutrient dense, all the vitamin A, but it's super high in copper. So kind of evaluating for myself, whether to be a little bit more moderate with that. Um, although, I mean, yeah, we don't need to get into all the details of copper toxicity, but it is something that I think is an aspect. It causes fatigue, um, mental health issues like anxiety, depression, bipolar, all these sort of syndromes, headaches. And it really goes high when you're low zinc. So in vegetarians, it goes really high. In pregnancy, it goes really high, high estrogen. So the carnivore diet is naturally a 
copper depleting healing thing because you're getting a lot of zinc to help you excrete the copper and you're cutting out all the high copper foods, which are avocados, chocolate, tea, nuts. Um, and then all the, the phytic acid and grains will bind the zinc and you won't absorb it. So it's this whole thing that I think is an, is an aspect of the carnivore diet that is super healing, but we're just maybe not paying attention or giving enough limelight to how zinc replete it is and how uh, depleted of copper it is. So I, I do like to just with my own copper talk issues, take some zinc um, supplement wise. Like I said, I'm way, I'm way down, but there's, there's a place for certain things and I'll use it like a, like a drug. You know, you can use herbs like a drug if you're really sick or, you know, if you want a little bit of an adaptogenic quality here, but, um, I just don't think the lever on those are very high. Whereas when you shift to eating meat, that's a very big lever. Whereas supplements are, are can be strong, can be minor. And, and it's, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of detail there, but yeah, makes sense. Um, <clears throat> that's really helpful. And, how about fasting? Um, have, have you played with that? Have you experimented with meal timing? How do you feel there? Yeah, that is one where, again, I think when I get off breastfeeding, I'll go into it more. Although it is, it's amazing how, how much you mimic fasting with carnivore. So the need for it, I'll, I'll check into it. Someone who, who is a binge eater and has, a history of eating issues. I think it's important maybe to watch like if you were strict and then you kind of go into weird binge mode or if you're underweight, like, do you really need to do long fasts? Maybe not, but it, it's amazing in terms of all the growth hormone and autophagy and, and just hormonal length you can go to. So I, I've played with it before the intermittent fasting, use it in my practice all the time, but uh, the common one here is all the juice fasting and all the the extended water fasting. And I think if you're not going to be ending your fast with a big steak and you're not keto adapted, then you might you might just be kind of on a weird depleting uh, law of diminishing returns kind of trajectory. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, yeah, I've seen Ted Naiman talk about how you get something like 70 to 80 percent of the glucose and, and autophagy benefits of fasting just from being kind of zero carb or low carb. Um, <clears throat> so I think a lot of times it, it's unnecessary and can add undue stress. Um, yeah. And can you talk about uh, two things you had mentioned you wanted to speak a little bit about is dairy and alcohol? Yeah, so I... I, I think, you know, I have a sort of addictive personality and, and kind of it runs in my, my history. And I think when I gave up, I, I would say my biggest probably sugar and processed foods, that's like me under the bridge with a paper bag, like homeless with a muffin is more of the issue than alcohol. But I did, I did, it's a progressive thing, alcohol. And so I would sort of categorize myself is being in denial a lot of the time of drinking my two glasses of wine at night and, Oh, I'm a foodie and it's fine. I'm functioning fine. My sleep's fine. But I really noticed. So about six months into carnivore, I was still having wine at night a lot of the time. And I'd be like, okay, I'm not eating any carbs, but I'm able, it, it actually helps you tolerate the level of wine or, you know, a couple glasses better, I think to be carnivore, but it was very apparent. Okay this isn't serving you. Why, why is that still there? So I, I credit carnivore with really helping me uh, quit alcohol t altogether. And I think for me, I noticed my sleep's better. My mood's a little better. And yeah, it, car alcohol is another one of those sort of, we're all in a little bit of denial of, of how, how, how much more it makes you anxious because there's this level when you drink alcohol, it calms your nervous system, but then your body releases all these stimulants to counteract that um, depressive quality on the nerves. So you just run more anxious and moody in general, and it disturbs your REM sleep. And so even if you're drinking a very moderate amount, it I, I think I got another 10% of energy by kicking it to the curb completely. 
Um, but I'm, I'm probably on the pink cloud of like, everyone's an alcoholic. Yeah. Everyone needs to stop drinking. But, and I don't necessarily think that's true, but for me, it seems like, it seems like carnivore helps you kind of go through your addictions one by one. And, and the latest one is dairy. Like, okay, let's, let's kick that one to the curb and see how we do. And so I'm, I'm in that one now, which, yeah, but alcohol, I would say is much easier to quit, at least for me than carbs. I mean, how many times am I relapsing with fruit or carbs? Whereas alcohol, I hasn't, I haven't really craved it or relapsed once. So I know that's not everyone, but nah, yeah. Carbs are harder than alcohol, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting how the, your sensitivity to these addictions gets turned up on carnivore to a degree. And, and I've had, um, Matt Cruz on, Matthew Cruz on to even talk about a pornography addiction, which he, which carnivore has helped him, um, beat or, or in the process of beating, uh, which is really interesting. And another topic you sent across, Hannah, is sleep. Um, can you talk about how sleep is different on carnivore or what you've seen with patients or yourself in that respect? Yeah, definitely meeting up an hour earlier and and seeming to have a little bit of more quality sleep. I, I'm a little interrupted. I, I recently night waned, but having a new baby is kind of like your sleep is effed anyways. But um, that's been beautiful. It seems to be a very common thing that you, I don't know why, but you just need less sleep. I guess if, if your system is running more efficiently and maybe your sleep is deeper, you just... Uh, you don't need as much. And, and I, I'm loving that morning hour. I, I used to be kind of slow to wake up and people would talk about their morning routines and I'd be like, I'm just trying to survive here, guys. Like, you know, yeah. and now it's like, Oh, okay. I'm going to do my yoga while I'm looking at the sunrise and my breath pat practice and getting weightlifting in. And it's, it's amazing. Uh, the, the productivity that, that this adds to your life as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, it's been it's been a great to talk to you today, Hannah. Really appreciate you coming on, learning more about your story and your approach. I'm sure folks will want to check out more about you and your content. Um, where can people find you and, and maybe something you're working on that they can expect from you? Yeah, so you can find me at Dr. Hannah Lay on Instagram. Um, so yeah, it's 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 Hannah and not Hannah. But oh, I, I excuse me. When, no worries. I I'm so used to it. I I don't even I didn't even correct you. But yeah, so Hannah Lay. It's H A N A L E I. And then just my name. Um, it's Hannah Roberts N D dot com is my website, and I'm on Facebook as well. And you know, I'm, I'm working more and more virtually. I, I have my practice here, but um, and working one on one with clients to come out and do kind of personalized retreats as well. And focusing a lot on circadian rhythm and breath work and cryotherapy and a lot of it, because, you know, once you once you dial carnivore is actually quite easy for most people. And then and then you can go to these whole other levels. So that's that's been exciting for me and um, can track me down. Awesome. Uh, well, apologies again, Hannah, for mispronouncing no. that the whole podcast. <laughs> but I'll link to all that in the show notes at carnivorecast.com. And uh, hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. Yeah. Aloha. Bye. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Carnivore Cast. If you enjoyed this episode, please review on iTunes. It really helps us out. And share it with a friend. What questions would you like answered? Or who would you like to hear from in the carnivore research community? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at CarnivoreCast or go to CarnivoreCast.com. You can also email me at info at CarnivoreCast.com. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, keep it carnivore.